<laughs> Good. Hey, people. Jeff Salzman here, and welcome to the Daily Evolver on our new daily show, Monday through Thursdays. Uh, it's Monday, October 9th, 2017, and the first snowy day here in Boulder. And it has, uh, it's been kind of bittersweet to see my garden dying. Um, I, as I may have said, I've gotten into gardening this year. And, and you know, it's a wonderful practice in seeing the arising, manifesting, and passing away of life, you know. And, and, and yet, as I was thinking about that this morning, I had a sort of a moral, a new moral dilemma arise. And I realized that, yeah, my perennials are go going to sleep, you know, the trees and the bushes and stuff that live from year to year. But my annuals, which are a lot of the flowers, begonias, geraniums, petunias, all of that sort of thing, they're going to just die. <laughs> and they're not going to wake up next spring. And, um, and I realized that this whole annual thing is the process of moving plants that don't belong where they are and can only live for a couple seasons, moving from them from where they can live year round to this place where they have to die each year. And, you know, are we gonna look back on that and see <laughs> a great oppression of the plant kingdom? We were talking last week about how m moral growth means extending your uh, center of moral consideration to more and more beings. And so, I don't know. I think I'm probably overthinking it, but it feels a little sad. So, yeah, uh, so does this topic today, actually. Um, I want to talk a bit about this massacre in Las Vegas uh, and um, if what, if anything, integral thinking can bring to some reconciliation or some understanding about this. And you know, just to refresh you, it's it basically what happened was, I guess it was nine or 10 days ago, a guy pretty much like me, a uh, year older than me, white guy, uh, gets a room at the um, Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas. And over three days, he creates a high tech sniper nest overlooking a big square uh, where he has uh, 40 weapons and 20 of them he's converted with this bump stock thing to uh, basically just short of machine guns uh, where they can fire uh, 50 rounds a minute. And um, so he's basically, you know, turned these semi-automatic guns into automatic guns. He set up cameras in the halls. He's created charts that calculate the height distance and drop rate of each weapon, plots a grid in this square, and then the night of action, he um, busts out two windows and starts firing on a country music concert, kills 58 people, so far have died. And the other statistic that in some ways is even more shocking to me is that he wounded just short of 500. That's a statistic we actually want to let breathe for a minute. 500 people wounded, hit, 58 killed. And predictably, and I think, you know, rightly, it has triggered a great conversation in this country, or a fight, you know, it's part of the culture wars, of course, uh, where we ask the question, how can this happen? Uh, and is this the kind of culture we want to live in? And why is this particular problem so unique to America in, in terms of the developed world? Um, America has 15 times the number of guns as Great Britain, for instance, and 40 times the gun deaths. And that's true. The statistics, we, we uh, um, compare badly to... Uh, basically all developed countries. And uh, again, could integral theory tell us anything about this? And there are a couple of things that come to mind. And one is that, of course, cultures have uh, interiors. This is the lower left quadrant using Ken Wilber's Aqua Maps. And 
the lower left quadrant is the interior of the collective. And the interior of the collective uh, is, you know, every culture has its own sort of personality. And America is unique in that we started as a new world, at least from the European, from the settler's perspective, not from the native perspective, but from um, the, the winners of that fight. Uh, this was a new world. And uh, in the interiors, and here we're talking about the upper left, you know, the interior of the people who came here. What is it to leave everything you've ever known? And when we're talking in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, when you left Europe to come to America, you were essentially saying goodbye to everybody you know, everything you know, and there was not much expectation that you would be back, uh, at least for the masses of people. And so there's a self-selecting type that comes out of that. It's assertive, it's self-confident, it's adventuresome. Um, or in the case of the Puritans, it's the most pious, the, the biggest religious nuts, the ones who really wouldn't buckle to the king's system. Uh, in uh, whether in terms of laws or in terms of religion. And so that sort of is the uh, eneotype, if you will, of the exterior, uh, or, I'm sorry, of the interior of the American psyche. And that's actually still true of immigrants. Uh, the most adventuresome, the most confident, the, you know, the ones who are, assertive. Uh, they're the ones who are drawn to leave what they know and come to a new country. So that is just part of the American spirit, if you will, uh, the American karma. And in the exteriors, uh, and this is the stuff, uh, the, the actual weaponry, the guns, uh, that's also different because we were a revolution in this new country. We were a do-over, do, do over, a whole new continent. And so there was no control uh, as there was in the countries of Europe and Japan, where uh, it was an evolution out of, into the sort of traditional systems where you were not allowed to have weapons. You, you were not allowed to defend yourself against the king. You couldn't have the latest and greatest. You couldn't get your buddies together and build a catapult. You know, you couldn't own guns when guns came into being. That was all part of state control. So that's just, you know, part of how that worked in the exteriors. So guns have just always been in our hands over here as, as soon as we had them. And it's actually interesting to see the history of guns and how they uh, really developed after the Revolutionary War and in the Indian Wars. That was a big uh, sort of technological impetus. And this is always true of weaponry from the Bronze Age to, again, catapults to nukes, is that weaponry has always led technology. Uh, and the reason is, is because weaponry magnifies our power on the gross realm on the realm of the physical. It's like engines, steam engines, and so forth. Anytime we can multiply our power, you know, that's what human beings are going to do. Now, that changes, actually, as we move into modernity. And uh, it, modernity, I no longer have to protect myself. There's police for that. There's uh, armies for that. There's courts for that. I don't have to protect my assets. You know, I don't, my money is not under my mattress. It's in a bank. I trust that when I call 911, the police will arrive. And mostly, and, and this is what's really astonishing and sort of magical about evolution and, and development, is I trust the people around me. Because what happens as we move into a mature traditionalism and, and definitely when we move into a sort of a modern um, uh, self-identity, we get peaceful. We no longer think that the way forward is to take what somebody else has. Uh, the other tribe, the other 
people, uh, uh, it, it, the, because we have a system that is provided for our security, we can now turn our attention to the subtle realm. And that's where the power is. We want to share ideas. We want to create together. And that's sort of how uh, th th that radical change uh, from traditionalism to modernity, where you get pacified, basically. But for people who are uh, at the traditional stage of development, and this is you know, where their self-sense, that's where they really feel at home. And this is about 35% of the population. Uh, that fear is still there, you know. Uh, they don't have to worry about the king's men, but they sort of extrapolate that to fears of the tyranny of the United States government. Um, and even though risks aren't, are, are radically diminished, uh, we live in radically more peaceful times in modernity than in traditional and certainly pre-traditional times. It's not zero. So there is some risk. And, uh, you know, a lot of my relatives uh, are gun owners and enthusiasts, and some of them do open carry where they have their little holster on their belt. And I was back home talking to one of my cousin's kids, actually, and he's one of these guys. He has a gun on his belt. And I was telling, he was asking me, do you own a gun? And I said, actually, I think I have one. My dad made me take when I left home, but I don't know where it is. And, and so the, you know, fun, the basic answer is no. And he said, you know, if you had kids and a wife, I would say you were irresponsible. But, you know, you're just you. You can do whatever you want. But that was his attitude, is that it would be irresponsible not to have some means of protection. And so what we see in the sort of gun culture of America is that it's not so much America's love affair with guns, it's traditionalists' love of guns. And the number of people, the number of households with guns has been steadily dropping. It's now about 35% of the population own guns. Now, most of those people own a lot of guns, but that's also sort of a function of modernity. They could afford more guns. So the average person who owns guns owns eight. And 3% of the population own half of the guns. So they own a lot more than eight, 20, 30, 40 guns. And so they own, you know, 3% of the population of the United States owns 150 million guns. So, so as I was saying, this then becomes part of this larger culture war between traditionalism and modernity, and particularly post-modernity. It's funny, by the time you get to post-modernity, guns are like, ooh, you know, they're scary. Uh, they're, 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 uh, something that you want to uh, get away from, to leave behind. They're dangerous. Uh, they're, and they're also a cultural marker. And one of the things that, you know, I'm always stressing that as an integral practice is we want to understand how people who think differently than we do and live really in a different world space than we do. They have different receptors, they have different antenna, they have different ways of processing information. Um, and we know, I mean, there's statistics that show that conservatives in general, and we're talking about this is the 35%, the traditionalists uh, have, you know, higher stress response, um, the, the galvanic skin response. They have uh, a, 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 they respond to fear in a way that is stronger than people at the higher levels who have divested some of that need to protect themselves to the culture at large. Uh, so that's where they live. And what they want us to know, this vast, vast majority of gun owners, is that they're good people. And they're the salt of the earth. And that Having a gun is one of the ways that they 
mark something that is very important to their identity. And that that is that they could take care of themselves. And they don't want to get in anybody else's business, uh, except culturally, and that's a whole other story. But they don't want you to tell them what to do. And, um, and they also want you to know that if you, you wimpy postmodernist, find yourself, you know, lethally threatened by a bad guy, they'll shoot him for you. And <laughs> you would probably be grateful that they did. And so, you know, it, it's, it becomes a cultural marker and it's not unlike in the, the terms of the cultural marker, a postmodernist gender bender who shaves half his hair and dyes the rest of the rest of the other half pink. And he too is, you know, kind of offending and, 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 and being willing to, uh, you know, sort of upset people in order to make a point about identity and worldview. And, you know, we want to look at this so that we could sort of relax our reflexive, you know, as I've often said, our you know, integral practitioners are waist to neck deep in green, postmodern uh, worldview. And so most of us have that sort of reflexive uh, anti-gun thing. So, um, you know, in terms of the culture war, it's now to the point where, well, back in the 80s, Republicans were 50-50 in terms of what they thought was more important, uh, gun rights or gun control. Now, Republicans are 75% for gun rights and 25% for gun control. And that's just a part of the continuing polarization. That's where we ha now have a majority of Americans who say gun rights are more comp important than gun control. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty of demagoguing on both sides, and I don't want to get into the, all of the arguments. It was really interesting to see Wayne LaPierre, uh, the head of the NRA, on, I guess it was Face the Nation yesterday, talking about that the real problem is the culture of Hollywood and uh, violent movies and uh, violent video games. And, uh, and, and, and here we are, the poor NRA, we're trying to teach people responsible gun ownership and, and gun usage. And this is what we're up against, is this culture of violence coming out of Hollywood, coming out of Hollywood liberals. Uh, so this is, uh, this, this war, this culture war will continue. There's no doubt about it. Um, I do think that there will be, um, th there will be, uh, a sea change, I'm thinking, at some point. And, and clearly, it's going the right direction in terms of the amount of gun violence. Um, and, and this is true not just in the, the United States. And by the way, other than gun violence, America is no more violent than any other uh, developed country in terms of uh, crime that is uh, perpetrated without guns. So, um, this is just the nature of modernity. In fact, it was, I'll, I'll read a paragraph from a Washington Post article where they talk about this very idea and, and, and how it's creating a conundrum among criminologists about why we're getting so much more peaceful. And they say, internationally, a decline in crime has been documented in many countries since the mid 1990s. According to the authors of a 30-country study on criminal victimization, there is no general agreement on all of the reasons for this decline. They say there's a general consensus that demographic change, specifically the shrinking proportion of adolescents across Europe, is a common factor causing decreases across Western countries. They also cite wider use of security measures in homes and businesses and other factors that reduce property crime. But other potential explanations, such as better policing or increased incarceration, which a lot of people point to, do not apply in Europe where policies vary widely. Uh, so it's just a 
general move into a more pacified stage of development. And as I said, when we are now in a situation, excuse me, where um, only 35% of people own guns, and that's a decreasing number. It's a decreased 20 points since the 70s. That's remarkable. And millennials are the least gun owning population in, in terms of age demographics. Uh, I think the tide could turn and, and at some point even turn quickly. Um, I, I, I was, I was uh, uh, sort of impressed by David Frum yesterday, who's a conservative columnist who was on one of the shows. And he was talking about that there's a cultural change when people realize that guns actually increase the danger of you and your family being hurt. There's, there's you know, no argument that people who own guns, have guns in the house, have more gun violence. Uh, most of it being suicides, which is well over half of gun deaths are suicides. And guns allow you to be more impulsive, and certainly more successful uh, if you're looking to off yourself. And, and then also accidents. And I think of myself as a little kid. I, uh, my dad had guns and he was very scrupulous about, you know, keeping them locked away and so forth, but not so his ammunition. And I remember I was probably eight or nine years old and I got one of his red shotgun shells, those big shotgun shells. And I thought to myself, so all that happens in that gun is that a hammer hits that shotgun shell and makes it explode. And does, is that right? And, and how does that work? And there was the shotgun shell and my dad had a workbench downstairs in our basement and he had a vice, you know, that you rip things in. And so I thought, I'm going uh, to see. And so I put that shotgun shell in the vise, and I thought, I'm going to hit it with a hammer and see if it, exp I don't know what I was thinking, but that, that is indeed what I was thinking. Uh, it, I, I, I grant you it doesn't make sense, but to a nine-year-old it did. I was just curious. And I started hitting it, and my mother was doing the laundry, and she looked over and she like screamed. You know, she couldn't believe I was doing that. And, um, you know, that kind of things happen. It's just, it, you, as parents, you know that you can't really control your kids 24 hours a day. And that's what David Frum was saying, was that um, at some point, as this continues to become known and people think about it and realize it, which actually is a, you know, movement into a new stage of development, uh, they'll realize that you're not a good parent if you have guns in the house, you're actually a bad parent. He used the example of people smoking in cars. When, you know, when I was a kid, my mom and dad smoked in the cars, we had the windows up. You would never do that now. Uh, they didn't do that because they were bad parents, they do, did that because they didn't realize that it would be harmful. And um, so that kind of change can happen quickly and, and radically. I, I was also impressed just one last uh, thought here that uh, Brett Stevens, who's another conservative columnist, came out for rescinding the Second Amendment, which, you know, is a, a whole other story. I've actually talked about the Second Amendment last time a bit. Um, you know, it, it talks about that because we need well regulated militias, there should be no infringement on the ownership of guns. And somewhere along the line, in a plain reading of that amendment, where's the well-regulated militias, you know? Uh, so anyway, uh, I also, uh, just actually one last point, and, I, uh, and, and this is from you, Corey, is that when we were texting a little bit about this yesterday, you talked about some uh, wisdom that you really, uh, it came up for you. 
yeah. that all of this happened that came from one of your gurus. And I, it'd be lovely, I think, if you'd share it, with, share it with everybody. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, to sort of preempt that, and, you know, I've got a couple other um, little layers I'd love to, to get your thoughts on, Jeff. But, um, yeah, you know, one of the things I noticed, because I was, I was awake um, when the shooting was happening, and I was watching you know, a lot of these uh, videos that were coming out and they were terrifying. I mean, it was, you know, it was like being in the trenches. It was, um, you know, you're just watching, you know, these people terrified and you're watching bullets ricocheting off the pavement, you know, just six inches in front of the cameraman. And, you know, it really pulls you in there and it's terrifying. And when you get terrified like that, when, you know, it pushes you into that um, defensive state, you know, Keith Witt just did a call last Saturday talking about how to disarm these defensive states. And oftentimes when you, you're presented with that type of brutality, there's, there's no disarming it. You just, you just sort of slide into it. And it really starts making you question, you know, what the, the value of humanity, what, what are we doing to ourselves? Why, why, why are we capable of such darkness and, um, you know, sociopathy and how is this within us and is this you know are we being defined by sort of that 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 dark quality um when these really traumatic events occur in real time and i went to you know i went to bed afterwards and um had some very restless sleep and you know a few nightmares and all that it you know it was it was deeply affecting and when i woke up in the morning um something shifted for me and right away uh popped in my head and it's you know it's sort of cliche but cliches are always prove themselves to be incredibly valuable at times like these um and one of my favorite teachers of the 20th century popped into my head who was uh mr rogers you know i'm i'm, I'm convinced that if jesus did come back in the 20th century he took the form of fred rogers uh, <laughs> I think that man is a living saint and if you're ever feeling sort of down about the world and down about reality. I suggest you watch a YouTube clip of, I think it's from like 1969 or something like the late sixties, early seventies. And Mr. Rogers is testifying to, you know, sort of a hard nosed uh, conservative at the time uh, about why PBS needs funding. And the amazing thing about Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers was that he talked to grownups the same way he talked to kids. He was the same guy on camera that he was off camera. And he, he, he carried that grace with him the entire time. And if you watch this YouTube clip, uh, you, you actually watch, you know, again, this, this conservative senator who's denying money for PBS. You just kind of watch him melt right before your eyes. And 15 minutes, after, you know, of, of Mr. Rogers talking, uh, the conservative senator says, congratulations, you've got your funding. So you're actually watching in real time, you know, how, how debate, how effective debate, um, how effective it can be. Um, it's, you know, so I suggest you guys watch that. So anyway, Mr. Rogers popped into my head and, you know, one of, the, one of, uh, I think his, his central teachings that I love the most, it got really popular after 9-11 was, you know, whenever something catastrophic happens, I always think to myself, look for the helpers, right? Look for the helpers, look for the people who are displaying just incredible courage in the face of terror who are running towards danger. And, you know, that really helped me release a lot of that sort of um, darkness that I was feeling. So I, I made a post on Facebook that was pretty well received and I'll just, I'll just read it here. Um, whatever it was. I think it's critical to remember that there were far more heroes than villains in Las Vegas last night. I've seen video after video of people running into danger in order to help others, ordinary citizens working together and risking their own lives to give people cover and help them escape the kill zone and bring the injured to the hospital. As the saintly Fred Rogers always said, look for the helpers. It does not diminish the pain and trauma and heartbreak a single bit, but it does offer an important reminder of the intrinsic goodness of human beings, which is too easily forgotten in the era we currently find ourselves in. And, um, Again, that was a shift for me, and I and I took it on as as an invitation for practice, right? So I I actually started seeking out the more positive videos, the heroic videos, the images of these heroes uh, in the hospital. Who you know, I saw one post and it was like, um, you know, here's the the random stranger who saved my sister's life, and he had a bullet in his neck, and he's smiling, you know, in the emergency room, 
uh, for this this uh, snapshot, and it was gorgeous. And you know, my eyes welled up, and it, it was gorgeous just to feel, you know, again in the face of this monstrosity, um, actually consciously deciding to say, you know, I, I need to touch in with the good, the intrinsic goodness of human beings, and you know, because it helps liberate so much of that, and it helps remind you that. Um, you know, evil is not the default mode of humanity. Um, quite the contrary. That's why it's so shocking when it does happen. Yeah, that's right. Now that said, you know, we take all of that, we take all the heartbreak, we take all of the grace, we take it together, and then, you know, uh, we look to our leaders and we get very frustrated as to why, you know, why isn't something happening out of this? Why, why is it so difficult to implement any meaningful change when it comes to gun laws? And, you know, one of the insights, Jeff, that occurred to me, well, sort of twofold. Uh, A, you were mentioning, um, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the beauty, the, the, the dignity and the disasters of, of uh, modernity. And, you know, one of those disasters, I think, was, um, you know, in, in the modern world, we are allowed, we're afforded sort of this distance with nature, which means a distance with death. You know, we don't, we don't kill our own food. We go to the supermarket and pick it up. We don't, you know, we have guns now where it used to be, you know, 500 years, if you wanted to kill someone, you'd have to stab him with something, look him in the eye and, you know, feel him die. And um, with guns, it's, it's been depersonalized. It's very distant. It's, you know, and I sort of, I, I think in that space uh, that we have, that the sort of the luxury of having this much space from death you know, the downside of that is sort of the fetishization of death. And, um, you know, Wayne Pierre t talks about violent films and video games and all that. And, you know, I think a more integral point of view would, to say, would be to say that, you know, these things are symptomatic of the deeper issue. They're not the cause of our fetishization of guns, our fetishization of weapons, but they're symptomatic of that. Um, there's a reason why there's a demand for these movies and for these video games. And it's not the movies and the games themselves that are creating that demand. So uh, that then further animates, you know, my own frustration that we can't seem to get anything done here. And I've sort of honed in on what I think is one of the central dilemmas facing, facing liberals right now, facing the left, which is, you know, one of the greatest contributions that postmodernism gave to the world is this really refined perception, observation, acknowledgement of how central language is to how we think, how we act, and how we self-organize, right? I mean, there's this, there's this postmodern, and, and this is where so much of the pathological liberalism that we like to talk about, micro, microaggression, safe spaces, all of this is an effort to sort of better regulate our cultural conversation. And it's interesting to me that this in many ways was one of postmodernism's greatest contributions, this really acute understanding of how central language is and how consciousness is a gas that expands to fill whatever container you allow for it. And language is that container. And, and yet, you know, Ken Wilber talks about, um, you know, Jeff, early in the episode, you mentioned how this is starting a dialogue. And my frustration is that I see this dialogue being generated time and time again and just stalling out. And I think one of the central dilemmas is that Ken has, has taken a deeper look at the lower left quadrant, well, really all the quadrants. And he notes how there's an inner and an outer to each of these quadrants. So for the lower left, there's an inner of the lower left and there's an outer of the lower left. These are called zone three and zone four. The inner of the lower left is sort of that sloppy, soupy dance that we do um, when we're relating with each other, right? And I, I can't really, I, I, I can contribute to the tone of our lower left, our inner of the lower left, but I can't change it myself. I can't, you know, there's nothing I can do there. It's just sort of, it, it is what it is. Um, but then there's the outer of the lower left, which is, which is the zone four. And, you know, that has to do with um, sort of the regulative patterns, the, the, the cohesion, the rules of discourse in a lot of ways. What I've noticed is that the conservatives are masters at defining that outer of the lower left. They're masters at regulating what is and what is not allowed to be talked about by culture. 
And this is a phenomenon called the Overton window, where the Overton window describes, you know, sort of the limits of public discourse. Um, you're allowed to talk about everything sort of in here, but nothing outside of there. And Donald Trump, one of the things that made him so notable was how easily he was able to shift that Overton window. All of a sudden, people were allowed to talk about things that even just six months prior, they were, no, they were not allowed to talk about. And the conservatives, I think, time and time again, have demonstrated a mastery of controlling that Overton window. So, you know, whenever these things happen, the first thing that the conservatives say, this is not the time to talk about gun legislation. That's them controlling the discourse. That's them actually establishing, being the referees, mm -hmm. and deciding what we're allowed to and what we're not allowed to talk yeah. about. Yeah, and how well did they do with that? Well, I, you know, it, it's interesting. I think, um, I mean, I, I, this, this, yes, and this is the, the, the sort of soup of the, and sort of the, the froth of moving forward. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree. I, you know. I totally agree. They should, I, I, yeah, did, did they stop the conversation? No. I think for people on the right, they stopped the conversation. But, the, you know, the people on the left are still talking about it. I don't know. You know, that's, that's a good thing. You know, my surprise, Jeff, was that, was that more of this didn't happen after Sandy Hook, right? Which was the most yeah. brutal. Over, and, and we got the same response. Now is not the time to talk about it. And guess what? The time to talk about it never, it, it, it never happened again. We never had yeah. another opportunity. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. The conservatives come around and say, okay, well, it's been three weeks since all that happened. Now we can have, you know, a reasonable discussion that's not animated by emotion and, you know, and all of that. Right. Um, and I get why you don't want to have that conversation when, Tensions are high. I understand that. And yet, you know, statistically, we're having a mass shooting every day of the year. Um, so the time to have this conversation is never going to occur if we allow them to continue regulating the discussion. And, and I think this is, you know, I, I think it's, it's my challenge to liberals is, you know, when you're, when you're trying to, to reestablish new rules of discourse, don't focus on the micro, right? Don't focus on the microaggressions even is, is, is one of their favorite terms. Back up and look at the macro. Back up and, and come up with some broader generalizations that can help us actually move the conversation forward. And you know, one of the, one of the only people on the left who I think have succeeded in shifting that Overton window was Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders made it okay for us to talk about single payer again. Um, that no liberal was successfully able to shift the window so much uh, to start having those conversations as Bernie. That's, that's great. And we should learn from that um, because he went bold, right? And that boldness, I think, helped shape, um, helped reshape the, the sort of the space in which we can relate with one another and, um, you know, what we're allowed to say, what we're not allowed to say. Um, and, I, and I see that as positive and I want to see liberals doing a bit more work uh, in terms of trying to better regulate um, that mode of discourse. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're just, uh, you know, discoursing our way into a better world. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's got their, you know, trying to impose their rules on other people. And it's just part of the mess of okay. it which is a fruitful mess yeah, because, and we can you know see that even in terms of uh guns and gun death the number of people uh, owning them down the number yeah. of, of gun deaths down by half since yeah. 1993 uh the, the guns used in crimes down i have this i don't know if you can see this mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it's just uh we, we got it. The big story is, is that we are becoming more and more peaceful, more and more sensitive, and we're having all of our crazy arguments as a means of getting us there. That's yep. how I see it. Yep. So. I do not disagree. <laughs> well, Jeff, it looks what like we have a question. It? All right, cool. Yeah. Um, in order for me to pull them over, though, you're going to have to briefly make me co-host, which is something we forgot to do in the pre-show. Right. Okay. Uh, there you go. Let's, there we go. All right. So we have a question from uh, Espen. I'm going to bring you on over. Hello, hello. hello. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? 
I'm doing hey, great. Hey. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the uh, the insights. Um, my English is a little bit rusty, so if I pause, it's to find the, the right words. I sit here in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that uh, this show is uh, going more daily. It's really right. one of my uh, watering holes for uh, getting something, uh, something integral. It's really, it's, it's not that common yet. So I appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, and I've been, I've been really following uh, the whole uh, American situation uh, since the uh, campaigns with Donald Trump and uh, Hillary. Uh, and uh, one of the things that is, is kind of, in, it, Americans are really good entertainers. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it's so much more fun to watch all the, the news channels uh, in, from the United States than it is to watch uh, the Danish stuff. Also because America has so much power, so it's, it's, it seems like it's just, the energy is just intensified. Yeah. And there are so many intelligent and talented people uh, on all sides of the, the political and uh, developmental spectrum. So you really, um, you, you get a lot of juice, whether you, you watch uh, the conservatives or the liberals, um, but also it's it's from from a European uh, standpoint. It's or at least from my standpoint as as a Danish person, um, America also seems kind of um, a little bit lacking in development. I mean, I think a, a lot of a lot of Europeans uh, are sort of wondering what what's going on. How can you elect a person like Donald Trump, which seems to be so deficient uh, in terms of, of uh, moral and uh, interpersonal development. Um, and I've been trying to, to kind of uh, f figure out why, why is this so? And um, as you mentioned, Jeff, it, there, there's this whole uh, um, Thing about the, the American soul, or what were the people who created America, and it, and I think uh, religion and self reliance so was very important. So it's like the red blue strata are very strong in the United States compared to Europe, where it was we were kind of pacified by the king. You might say he he we didn't, we didn't I mean people have had weapons I think for hunting, but. Um, one of the things that, that I notice is really different in the United States is that you have a very large group of people who don't really trust the government. Yep. They don't really think that the government is there for, for the benefit. And, and I see, so it's, it's, it's really, it, it is kind of a de developmental issue, but because conservatives also, I think in Denmark are more like, get your hands off me, but they don't have guns. So, so it's like if, if they get pissed or kind of uh, crazy or depressed, they don't shoot themselves. Sometimes they do or they hang themselves and they don't shoot other people. And uh, Danish gangsters don't have as many guns either. Yeah. So, so the access to guns, I think is really one of the, I mean, it's, it's probably the crucial factor but also the sentiment. I mean, what is keeping the American conservatives from relinquishing their guns to the government is that would need for them to be trusting uh, to that government. And, and it seems like you have the conservatives in, in the United States have so much power uh, also compared to their numbers. So it's, it, and, and your political system it's made in this, it's, it's so perfect for polarization because you don't, you only have the, these two parties. In Denmark, we have, in our parliament, we have like five or seven parties, which are kind of graded. Some are more blue, some are more orange. Some are, you have, we have these mixes, some are blue, orange, some are orange, green, and so on. So, so we, 
we we also have like the 20 25 percent maybe a little bit lower on hardcore blue than than in the united states but but they have to have a very like fortunate hand to get the amount of influence that the conservatives in the united states seem to have mm -hmm. um so 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 I think there's there's something about the amount of power that the blue meme has in the United States, which is kind of out of balance at, uh, compared to how many, how much, how big a proportion of the population they actually uh, make. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I do. Uh, there's two things. One is, uh, I think, compared to Western Europe and particularly Denmark, uh, the United States is a good half step, uh, less developed, if you will. Uh, we have a higher proportion of traditionalists. Our traditionalists have guns for the reasons that I talked about before, because of our cult culture versus your culture. Uh, but uh, the other thing is that World War II uh, w was uh, really forced Europe's, Europeans to see the limits of traditionalism, the limits of the idea that my nationality, my group, my people are ascendant. The United States actually experienced World War II as a victory, yeah. not as a defeat. And um, that, I think, makes a lot of difference too. So, and then, so there's that. The other thing is the, the structural, uh, the structure of our government, the two-party system, gerrymandering, the fact that uh, Wyoming with 300,000 people gets as many senators as California with 27 million people. You know, that, that is a very, very systemic structural problem. And I think, uh, who knows? How, how that might go and might change as, as millennials take power and, and people who are even younger uh, take power. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, the, the idea that this is how it will be forever, uh, you know, history belies that. Everything changes. And uh, so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, those are the couple of things that we're really up against here. Yeah. Plus the fact, you know, America has a very long and proud history of conspiracy theory. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is back in the 60s, it was the liberals who were sort of, you know, mistrustful of the government and, you know, down with the man and, and all of that. And we've, you know, once again, our political parties have sort of switched places where now it's, you know, the liberals tend to be pro-government, um, pro, you know, I would say pro-self-organization in a lot of ways. And the conservatives are the ones who are currently very distrustful of those larger mm -hmm. political structures. Yeah, and, and to, to your point, Jeff, that you actually won the World War II. One of, one of the things that I've been considering is that for the blue meme or the ethnocentric to, to really people to want to move out of that, uh, it, it, it maybe it takes some kind of defeat. It does. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's so attractive to be on top of the world. So why would anybody give that up Absolutely. unless they were uh, challenged I mean, or, or it, defeated it, by it, the from, or, from a traditional point of view, it proved our superiority. Exactly. You so know. I think that's, that's part of why the U.S. is still kind of lacking, because you, you can, the whole world maybe, or the feeling is that the whole world looks up to you. I think from that perspective, and it's, it's partially true at least, that even though we don't agree with you and we think you're sometimes a little bit uh, crazy, <laughs> we are still very impressed by what you're actually capable of doing um, in terms of military, in terms of business, in terms of entertainment. So, so as long as the, we have this constellation, then I think Americans at the ethnocentric level can really be kind of snuck in that uh, feeling of being the, the beacon of the world and so on and so forth. Yeah. Even yeah. And, 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 us, well, you def Europe, uh, even the, the, the countries that's so-called victors experienced a ruinous win. 
you know. So um, you guys had that really thrust in your face and you saw the limits of that thinking, the traditionalist thinking. Uh, we didn't, uh, but maybe through seeing things like Las Vegas, uh, you know, Orlando, the whole litany, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, there is, you know, something's behind this growth that I'm noting here in America, you know, in terms of development. Uh, fewer guns, fewer gun violence, even though, you know, in the karma of how things move, we have these crazy, you know, sort of uh, occurrences. But this may be our version, a smaller version of what it takes to wake up. Because, you know, defeat and tragedy, I hate to say it, but they're powerful engines of evolution. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the Donald Trump could actually be also accelerating it because you will experience that you cannot take our or the rest of the world's admiration for granted. When you elect a guy like Donald Trump, there will be blowback and, and uh, America will lose some of the, the credibility and respect that it has built up uh, for all the positive uh, factors yeah. it's also had yeah. the last seven but years. In the process, we all see each other more clearly. We all see more textures and more, we have more information about each other. And that itself is the definition of increased consciousness, what you're able to see. So you're, you, a, a Dane, are now able to see into America in a deeper way than you could before. And that too is potent. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes yeah. weakness, seeing, seeing the big brothers or the strong people's weaknesses can also, I mean, if we talk about Donald Trump as a sort of a weakness also in, in the collective psyche of, of uh, the United States, and um, I mean, we all have sort of Trumpish characteristics. Yeah, totally. But, but, but seeing that, Seeing that we, as, as Angela Merkel said, we cannot rely on the United States. Right? She said we have to rely on ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that can also kind of turn some of the power dynamics internationally. If, if Europe becomes less reliant on America, then America will not have the same feeling of having to protect everybody. I mean, that's also kind of a pressure. You can't really leave the blue aggressive yeah. state if you have to protect the yeah. free world, yes. but, but if the free world starts to protect itself, then you, maybe you can relax a little bit and yeah. give yeah. some of your guns back. I think that is so true. Yeah. 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 I think one of the more difficult pressures that Americans face is, you know, we look at Europe and we see, you know, all the social welfare programs and how well they work. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that frustrates America, you know, Americans are like, why can't we have that too? And, you know, very often the response is because we have to spend so much money on our own military to protect these countries. So in a certain way, you know, a lot of European countries have the luxury of being able to uh, create these social welfare programs because they don't have to pay into their own militaries as much as, as our country does. Um, and that creates a very difficult dilemma. It's true. Actually, it's, it's something that's not very clear. It just now it, this idea uh, arrives in my mind that, that we actually, that our welfare systems are benefited by the American military in, and, and that, that's obviously not a fair situation for America either, but it's not very, uh, it's not very obvious in the discourse mm -hmm. in Europe that, that this is taking place. But so it's also, it's also ha having this kind of conversations, you know, that can, uh, where we can become more transparent to ourselves and to each other, because I can see why Americans would be frustrated by that, because yeah. you spend so much money on military, and to Europeans it seems like it has to do with you. We don't see that it has anything to do with ourselves. That's right. But but I can see that uh, now that. Uh, well, thank you. thank you for noticing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and thank you for, for <laughs> joining us, today, Aspen. That was that was really lovely. Yes, indeed. So Jeff, it looks like we have uh, one other question. We've got just a few more minutes to take it. Um, question from Shika. So I'm gonna pull her on over. So um, I saw this article, this headline, uh, and I didn't read the article for a number of reasons, but it was um, about the kind of 
that hit the um the uh, person's girlfriend was talking about um he used to i guess um lay in bed and and wail and moan and um i was just thinking what kind of level of distress and how to and i i actually this is a little bit hypocritical because i because i don't i i personally get furious when people bring med, like the mental health discussion into the gun discussion but um but regardless of diagnosis or anything like that i just wonder you know what what kind of tools could we even create to to treat that level of distress mm. you know um and i think you know, and it's, it's an understandable distress. You know, we live in a very difficult, distressing world. Life is very difficult. And, um, you know, I, and people respond in, in a lot of ways. And I think, but the, the core problem is, is really that, um, that we've created this environment to create this level of distress. And then our automatic response is to attack people to have, who, who have that level of distress, you know, and, um, and that only escalates it. Um, so I don't know exactly what the question is in that, but um, that's, that's it. Well, all I'd say is, this, is that uh, this latest shooter is just one more lesson in what uh, is the, you know, what's behind this kind of an act. So we all get to see him. We all get to see the Sandy Hook guy. We see all of these people, and there is a sensitivity. There's a literally a raised consciousness about um, uh, looking around at the people in our lives. And I think that people are more sensitive. They are more um, uh, aware. And uh, that's just part of the cultural evolution that we reach out to each other and, 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 and raise the alarm when we see somebody who is getting into dangerous territory. And will that ever be a perfect system? No. But uh, I think just as we're sensitive to wife abuse or child abuse in ways that when I was a kid, people would just turn their head. Not anymore. And that's more and more true of people who are acting in ways that are threatening. Yeah. Yeah, it actually reminds me of uh, the Onion had, you know, the Onion always has uh, killer headlines whenever something like this happens that just sort of slices right through your heart, right? I mean, they're, they're actually really good about that. Uh, the one that was circulating last week was, you know, I had a picture of Paul Ryan, and it says, this shooting isn't about gun control we refuse to pass. It's about access to mental health care we're continuing to gut. Right. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, that's a, another one of those paradoxes that we're in where, you know, something like, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act, which has, you know, a lot of provisions in it for mental health. And yet, passing the ACA only further stokes this sort of anti-government, you know, fringe and causes them to buy more guns and more ammunition and all of that. So the very act of trying to create a federal program that can hopefully begin to address a lot of these really challenging mental health issues that, you know, look, Jeff, I agree with you that we as a nation are more sensitive, more aware, more conscious, all that. We're also probably a bit more neurotic uh, right now than we've been in a while. Um, so mental health, I think, is, is obviously critical. And it's, you know, it's it, one of the gifts, I think, of the integral mind is that you're able to see how all of these different systems interact and feedback on each other. And you can see how there's a healthcare problem with our, our um, you know, gun legislation. And you, know, you see how all of these things sort of interconnect and reinforce each other and all of that. And it gets, and it gets really sticky. And, and I'm with you. I also get frustrated when the conversation immediately turns to, to mental health because oftentimes it's used as an excuse. And yet we can't separate that from the conversation. We need to be able to have a more holistic conversation about how these systems are functioning with each other, how they're, uh, whether they're making us more neurotic, less neurotic, whether they're creating opportunities for treatment, whether they're creating opportunities for increased wellness, um, which itself would lead to an increase of our, you know, just moral center of gravity, I think. Um, really difficult issues. All right. Well, I think that's enough for today. I think so. 
that was a great show. Yes, indeed. All right. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Corey. Hey, thank you, Jeff. This has been great. And uh, we'll see everyone back here tomorrow, same time, 1 o'clock Mountain, 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern. Um, we're doing these uh, every day, Monday through Thursday. Um, I, Jeff, one of the things I posted on Facebook was, you know, there's often a gap between the things that we talk about on Integral Life and the things that are talked about in uh, the larger integral community and places like Facebook. And this is, I think, our opportunity to close that gap a little bit. And I hope you guys will take the invitation and join us and add your voice to, to Jeff's. And that's about it. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.